And oops, second, I didn't I click my phone in the presentation. For those of you who are not familiar with my use of technology, I'm not checking messages. This is my remote for the morning. So then I can, you know, I can pull over and see all my slides and move around and do all kinds of cool things. So uh, I'm Jane Keezy, if you haven't met me yet. And welcome to perhaps the most unusual presentation we've had for a while at a type conference. Um, we've had type and body movement, but uh, as my colleagues in this project, my partners in crime keep saying, this is the first world-class approach to type and style. And uh, just to show you how world-class it is. I had nothing to do with that. Uh, I added the type expertise to this project. And where it all started was uh, probably three years ago, I think it was. This is Jill Chivers. Uh, actually, you know, when Dario said we were ma wearing masks today, I am in full costume today. I'm channeling my inner Jill Chivers. If you don't know Jill, she is a, um, a type expert out of Australia. And uh, she is an ESFJ. And she never goes anywhere without at least some animal print somewhere. It might be a bracelet, it might be a belt, it might be a full suit jacket or dress or something, but it's not what? Car got leopard print. It's her car is a leopard print. Oh yes, her car seats are leopard print. You will notice little bits of leopard print in some of the graphics and all as she comes to her type. So, so this is the only animal print I own. Uh, I was forced, no, no, I wasn't forced to buy it, but my daughter, um, strongly encouraged me. She's an ENTJ, a great source of fashion advice. Uh, and I thought, well, for today, I will wear this. And uh, it will probably be the only piece I ever own of animal print, because I do feel like I'm in someone else's clothes whenever I put this on. And that's part of the essence of this project. So at any rate, Jill and I were out for a day of op shopping, going to secondhand clothing stores in Australia, which is one of Jill's specialties, is being able to walk into an op shop and find that treasure for herself or for someone else. She's free with her fashion advice, thank goodness, because I need it. Uh, and we stopped for a coffee because it was a rainy, overcast, cool day, um, just, just warm enough to be outside. And Jill said, Jane, don't you think there's a connection between style and type? And I'll stop the Australian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we started chatting about it. And you all know at a gut level that there is, right? Yeah. And I'm not going to, don't answer this question. Do not answer it. But which type is most likely to show up not wearing something that suits them? Okay? Again, don't answer. What type is most likely to look like they put on a uniform for the 19th time? There's a wonderful scene in a, an American show called um, Family Ties. Danny, the father, uh, is definitely an organized um, detail-oriented, introverted uh, decision maker. I didn't name the letters, but you should be able to figure it out. And inside his shirts, it says whether it's a Monday shirt or a Tuesday shirt. And I was doing a math workshop one time, and I said, we can't use that as an example with students because we wouldn't want to stereotype someone that way. And one of the math teachers raised his hand and said, two girls stopped me in the hall and said I was wearing my Tuesday shirt on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so type will out. And that's where this, was, where this started. And uh, so Jill is a fabulously creative person, as you will see. And she actually has a hard time going to type events because what happens is people in the type community say, you're so creative, you must be an intuitive, you're mistyped. And of course, sensing types are fabulously creative, just in a different way. So you are going to get immersed today in the sensing style of creativity. I was the knowledge base, not the creative one. Uh, and Jill, uh, several years ago, this is her web, one of her websites, Shop Your Own Wardrobe, she realized that she was bordering on shopaholicism and went on a year-long, um, what do you call it, uh, moratorium, did not, did not buy a thing for a year and learned to, to have fun in her own closet and figure out for herself what psychologically was driving her to use shopping as a crutch and developed a blog over it that Greg, uh, garnered a great following, and also uh, a program to help shopaholics uh, stop the, the behaviors. And because of that, she was invited to be on the 
um, for, for my Australians, is Tonight, Today show? What's the, get it? Today, Tonight. Today, Tonight? Yeah, she's also on um, Good Morning Australia, I think, as well. She's had over 100 media appearances. But on the very first one, where Kat, where's Catherine? Catherine and I were at Jill's house when this episode premiered, and it, it's a major show. I don't know what the British equivalent would be, but this is, you know, prime time television, millions of people watching. And if you know about television, you never know what they're going to do to you. And there was an episode on shopaholicism, and they had Jill, they had a university professor who had studied addiction to shopping, and then they had another shopaholic. And they made Jill, Jill the hero, thank goodness. Um, but we were holding her hands. The other shopaholic, they constantly showed her in light that made her hair look stringy. And, you know, she talked about running up the credit card debt and all that, and, you know, was just like in tears. And the professor they made look like, um, you know, she was still holding the suffragette sign. I don't know how else, and they just stereotyped her as this, um, uh, you know what I mean, um, yeah, starts with a B. And at any rate, uh, you know, just the, you know, intellectual approach. And then they, they let Jill just shine. I mean, Jill's fun on camera anyway, but they actually went into Jill's wardrobe. They had her spread all her, what, did she have 11 print jackets? Or were there more than that? At least. At least 11, you know, so there was three or four in leopard skin and a couple of zebra, the suit coat jackets. And, uh, you know, she got them all out, and the, the cameraman said something like, isn't this excessive? And Jill goes, well, they're all different. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. And, they, you know, they had cute little things with their feet, so she just shined them, and that led to the other appearances. So um, Jill has always had an interest in style. She's put my uh, several parts of my wardrobe together. I look to her for advice all the time. And one of the things Jill did was send me to Imogen Lamport, who's a well-known stylist in Australia, one of the top ten bloggers on style in the world. She has style credentials like we build type credentials and coaching credentials. Uh, and she's using this project to go to the next level of expertise certification in the um, International Style Society, which, whatever the name of it, she prefers INTJ. She was... Uh, skeptical about type until we got some of the interviews back and she saw how it fit with her clients. As an INTJ, guess who comes to her for style advice? Thinking women, yeah. And so it all made sense to her on who was showing up and what sort of advice they wanted. And uh, so she, she'll actually go through type pro certification this month to become, you know, she's learned so much on her own and now she wants to be official about it. So thanks to our online program that Angelina and Gareth developed. Um, she'll be doing that. But Imogen uh, is known for developing her own color system. And uh, I forgot to pull mine out. Uh, but how many of you have ever had your colors done? OK, did you go? I know Chris has a great system. Was it just the, the summer, winter, spring, autumn, or was it more in depth? More in depth. More in depth? Because if it's just the four, it's like disc. It's not the full thing. This is my. I have two things in here. One is my little travel, um, I'm intriguing. And Imogen came up with her own system because, of course, when an INTJ goes into research mode, they really go into research mode. And so, you know, these are my best colors, or these are my colors. I'm intriguing. She has 18 different um, color combinations that she came up with, all with different names. Um, so not only that, but she actually substituted out some to make sure it was just for me. And then on the back of some, I have pink dots. And these pink dot colors, if you notice I'm, I'm wearing some of them today, are the ones that if I'm going to buy an investment piece or do a presentation, these are, and they're not all browns, so I'm just at that end of the stack, um, or I'm doing presentations or something, these are, these are the ones that I should you know, pay more money for or make sure I'm presenting in, which, you know, backed up using the leopard print today, even though it's not me. Um, so that's one use, and as you age, your coloring changes. So last time I was down there, Imogen calmly and um, handed to Jill like the muted set of what Jill had been wearing her whole life. Just, honey, it's time to just you know, go down a bit. Um, so I have pink dot colors. Jill has a double dot blue, you know, and I don't have any double dot colors. I feel so, so deprived. Nothing that's just so stunning that that's what you buy the six hundred dollars silk blouse in. Um, Jill has two double dot colors. So. But then the other thing Imogen does is, um, these are two color palettes that are sort of close together. And you can walk into a store and you're looking at the neutrals and you're not sure, like, is it right or wrong? These are my neutrals. 
Can you, can you kind of see this? Mm -hmm. yeah. These are the neutrals of the, of the palette I'm most likely to make a mistake with um. and how different they are. So I can see whether something works with mine or with this one and know whether it's really the match for me. It's great because you're making a mistake one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's part of it because that often nails it. Oops, I need to get this, not this, or this isn't worth it. Uh, and you're never stuck in a rut. It's like type. She says, if 80% of your wardrobe is in your colors, then you can play with that one piece where you're just going, I want that sweatshirt because, you know, or the, um, what, was, what was the t-shirt I found this time? Um, oh, the National Sarcasm Society, like we needed your support. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and Jill, Jill, Imogen is known as Inside Out Style. And she blogs almost every day. And where she comes up with yet another thing you want to know about style is just incredible. They're short little blogs. I follow her on Facebook, um, and, and she just keeps coming up with these gems of wisdom about, um, you know, how do you, how do you layer for in early spring, or how do you make a big necklace work for you, or um, how do you make sure you can find stuff in your closet? I mean, the, the, the it's, it's an INTJ on steroids about um, <laughs> your intuitive intuition and type. So just my mission is to help you look and feel fabulous every single day. Um, so this, these are my partners in this. Uh, someone said to me, Jane, isn't this a little trivial for you? And I said, uh, how much money every year is wasted by women and men buying the wrong clothes? There's nothing trivial about this. And why does it connect to type? Because, how, and this isn't about like what color to wear. That is a separate um, topic. Or what skirt is going to fit me best, an A-line, a broom skirt, or whatever. Body type and color and all are separate from our personalities, right? There are systems out there because uh, Jill, we, this, this is not a project on Lightly. It was part of why I'm you know, bringing this to the type conference. We read all the competition. Uh, and there's this one woman, her book's called Dress Your Truth. And it's based on four personalities, herself, her daughter, her daughter-in-law, and her mother, um, which is pretty much ENTJ, ISFJ. You know, it's just this. And she assumes that your facial structure, your body type, your color is all driven off that. So you've got these four choices. How do you think that works? She is a marketer. She is making a mint. There's others that just go at, um, do you like classic dress? Do you like dramatic dress? Uh, and that's another feature. What we did in ours is say everybody interprets that differently. You know, I have elements of classic in what I do, but it doesn't look like what an ESTJ does with classic, for example. Uh, so that's that's all done. I just brought the type of Okay. So, because um, this is me, you know, in my natural habitat, wearing my <coughs> clothes. Um, the INFJ who would rather um, be, it, it, you know, if you really want to treat me, invite me to do a type retreat someplace where I can train in my jeans or shorts. Um, and uh, so, you know, what the heck am I doing with the style project? Well, as I, as I start blogging for it, I figure I'll blog about all the mistakes I've made and all the great advice I get and all of those things. But in, in truth, you know, I do have the research background. I'm the, I'm the one with the doctorate who knows how to do the research side of this, and we did this as a research project. Uh, going back to this slide, I said to Jill, um, well, let's start with, you know, like a survey, and we have good friends who have a sense of style who prefer ESTJ, one of them's in this room, uh, Sue Blair, and we have good friends with INFP preferences that also have a good sense of style. Uh, especially Meredith Fuller over in Australia, who I, I don't remember if I've got pictures in. Yeah, I do. I do have a picture of her. Uh, and so let's send it out to three that we know well that will answer us and try a survey and see if we see some differences because then we'll, we'll, we will know where to go. And if you want to do type research, I strongly recommend this approach. You know, taking a little sample um, before you go big because it didn't work. <laughs> okay. So this was the survey in phase one. We had the, the two test groups, um, and we had questions. It was just a survey. You know, we sent them out to SurveyMonkey. Um, Sue answered this. Sue has, Sue has been um, at our beck and call at every moment along the way. Thank you, Sue. You know, reading things, telling us when we're being idiots, not practical enough. It's, well, Jill's pretty good at that, too. But um, I think you were truly interested, or you would have sold us to go away, right? Okay. Uh, so, so we just sent out a survey monkey and had them answer things like, uh, how do you know when you bought the wrong items? Rank the choices. Uh, usually, uh, the, and your options are things like, usually has to, someone has to tell me I bought the wrong choice. 
or I realize it's just hanging in my closet, never worn. It isn't comfortable, the tags are still attached. I feel like I'm in someone else's clothes. Um, I may put it on, but I always end up taking it off and not wearing it. How do you know these things? Um, the, the, when we looked at the survey results, it showed nothing. As a matter of fact, the INFPs, one of the INFPs said, I can't answer this, it's not unique enough to me, was sort of the, the tone of it all. So we threw that out the window, because um, everything was other please explain. But we could see some of the differences, and we knew it was there. So face, uh, yeah, showed nothing, uh, no patterns whatsoever. <laughs> Um, really, you know, that's the nature of research is to not be as simple as you thought it was going to be. So we turn to something called critical incident technique interviews. I just want I want to, what, what Indigen and Jill have done with this is, like, I can't believe it. Every time I go out to our new website or see what's in Dropbox, um, I'm blown away by their creativity. But I want to emphasize that we really did ground this in, you know, the kind of research that we've done on type in healthcare and type in spirituality and type in coaching. It's the same, same stuff that's underlying style types. Um, so what is this? Um, it, it's questions that elicit stories from people. So if you get enough content from people, you actually get behind what they actually did. You know, they, they, you know when I used to do a lot of magazine interviewing, you knew when a person was telling the story in the way they told it over and over mm -hmm. again. Um, one of my colleagues had a little um, symbol for that because you you don't want that. You want them to get off the off the track. But she, you know, pretend like she was putting a needle on an old uh, vinyl record and just spin it. And you're, okay, we got to break them out of this. So, so you're doing enough um, to get people away from what they say they do to what they actually do. Um, and this was actually I thought this was cool. It was developed in England during the Second World War to help um, train pilots and such. During, during the war to get them just away from what they say they do to what they actually do. And it focuses on narrative, and it captures respondents' thoughts, accounts of actions, feelings, words. Um, Jill is a fabulous interviewer, and I'm a really fast typist, so it was a match made in heaven. We interviewed women from four different countries. Uh, I think we've got involvement from seven countries. Uh, we were a little limited. We needed it in English, and in, probably English as a first language just to make it easy to get all these nuances. And uh, once again, to start with, we interviewed Sue as ESTJ and went to look at what she said and tested it out with a couple of other ESTJs. Rob's wife, Carly Toomey, was instrumental in that. Um, and uh, then the INFP and testing it with a couple of INFPs to see what we were on target with. And this time, we got results. We saw what we thought we would. Um, and I'll tell a few stories off of this. But, I just want to emphasize, these are some of the questions that Jill had at her fingertips. These were 90-minute interviews, and Jill knew exactly what information we were trying to fill in as far as, um, you know, what does style mean? How do you know when you've made mistakes? How do you actually shop? What sources do you trust? We have these big categories. What advice would you give to other women of your type to get up to speed on your stylish self faster than they might otherwise do? Um, that's just a sample. Those are, I mean, this is what she had in front of her for a 90-minute interview. And Jill was shifting, depending on what the stories were and where they went. And I just had to type, which is great for an introvert. So what happened during the interviews? OK. Uh, type will out. There were moments when, and, and this is all, you, 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 when you're interviewing, you can't always show your expressions. So we would get off the phone with, or off of Zoom with whoever we were interviewing. And nine times out of 10, just start laughing, or 15 times out of 16, because of what had happened that was so predictable by type. Um, I, I wish I had time to share all the stories, but I'm going to tell a few of them. Um, first of all, um, I, I want to show you that Jill asked for um, photos from all the interviewees that we were supposed to get in advance. And these are Jill, this is Jill in all her leopard skin glory. So we wanted pictures of their favorite outfits, their accessories, their shoes, you know, whatever. And there, there's a whole, right, Sue, there's a whole list of instructions. Yeah, it's um, really hard act to follow. It's, it's a pretty hard, but Sue did a really good job. This is Sue's photo shoot. I, I believe you got your son out of bed early oh, in the morning. Oh, yeah, he was not at all happy. Yeah. <laughs> so we have Sue. Does Sue look nice with the same sort of thing, um, showing all the examples and everything? So we had all this. Oh, this is Meredith. This is the INFP. Um, so that he, he, can you believe this? how Meredith organized her things in these beautiful 
so you did a nice job, but Meredith, um, you know, just everything is, is uh, can you see that at the back of the room? Is it magnificent or what? You didn't tell me to organize the <laughs> you did a lovely job. I mean, look at how you pose. And you don't have as many. You know, one, one of the markers for ESTJ that we found was very few but very versatile accessories. Mm -hmm. So Sue just has this amazing watch and bracelet that she wears all the time, right? Whereas Meredith, you know, has baskets full of things and has to rotate her clothes around the house. Because she never throws anything away because she's, she's a... Um, uh, counselor, but she also does a lot with theater, and something might always be useful again. Uh, whereas Sue, it's no, that's rubbish, get it out. <laughs> um, but here's all the instructions. So I just wanted this, you know, um, the sensing organization and detail was, was evident. So we asked people for photos, and the ENFJ, um, come on, why are we not going to go down? The ENFJ sent us 39 photos. She mm -hmm. created a special, we only asked for six or seven, mm -hmm. but she was like, ooh, and I've got another one. And she actually created a special Dropbox folder to keep adding to so we could see all of her favorite outfits and everything else. So there's the ENFJ pos posed with Audrey Hepburn. Um, the ISTP sent us zero photos. Type will out. I had to stalk her on Facebook to find <laughs> oh, yes. oh. And she's really, this is Marcy Siegel, a fabulous ISTP trainer out of uh, Canada, was our ISTP. She keynoted at the Toronto conference uh, on creativity. She's great, but I mean, just no photos. It's like, no, too much bother. We had a hard time talking her into the interview. You know, the ISTP walking away from, backing up from style, going, what do you want to know? What are you going to ask me? Um, so then, what are we doing? Take this down. I see my phone isn't. My phone was frozen. That would answer it. Okay. So let's see if it'll come back now. No? Oh, yeah, it did. Okay. When we sent the first report, which it was about seven pages of information to the ENFJ, she said, This is perfect. Don't change a word. That, Susan, you may have changed some words, but you know, this person who was one of Jill's um, colleagues, she said, Don't change a word. And um, dear Marcy, Dear Marcy, um, emailed us <laughs> two and a half hours <laughs> through page six, you know, is, is this what you want to be? And she was, like, correcting and asking every little bit of grammar question and everything else. So that was interesting in itself. And, you know, whereas, whereas the ENFJ was, was sparkling during the whole interview, um, Mar Marcy got a snarkiness to her as we were asking. Because style is just not one of her things at, at all, even though she's very stylish in how she dresses. Um, I will say too that um, one of the one of the surprising stories. There was a moment in every interview, but when Marcy said that um, when she got married, she just offloaded the whole wedding dress decision to someone else. Mm. You know, the ISTP saying, "I have no idea. I'm going to let someone else dress me." Is there anyone else in here who would let somebody else just abs do the whole wedding dress thing? <laughs> The guy, yeah. <laughs> the guys, I know. Um, I don't know why we're not working here. We'll come back and figure that out. So, so that was one set. ENFJ, IS, I, uh, STP. Uh, the other that I'll, that I'll talk about today uh, is ISTJ, ENFP. Um, <laughs> this is my my lovely sister-in-law of 35 years, Ellen. The ISTJ. And she was very worried about doing the interview. She is her, her career was as a um, interior designer, and very be very accurate and careful about what would work in a room and all of that. Uh, and she doesn't think she has a creative bone in her body, even though she really, really does. Uh, Christmas at their house. I mean, she rotates the posters and the artwork. Um, you know, I get like a B plus at Christmas, and I got these two sisters in law that. You know, it's over the top with matching everything. When we had a shower for one of my nieces at my house, a wedding shower. Do you do wedding showers? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Ellen brought over five boxes of stuff a week in advance to decorate my house with. I was in charge of food. She was in charge of everything else. Um, and that was because the decorations wouldn't fit in her car. There was another load that was coming on the day of the shower. Um, so does that give you an idea of her creativity? So the day of the interview, we're, we're on Zoom, and Ellen's not technically oriented. She scheduled the interview for her, the day her daughter, who's a doctoral student in um, feminist um, theory, it was home. 
And so Lauren set her up on the, the iPad. And we, we turn it on, and Ellen is sitting there, and she's got her iPad on the counter. There is absolutely nothing else on the counter but her typed notes to the questions that we had sent out in advance and a glass of water. Okay? And Ellen is ready for the interview and actually read us her responses and, you know, Jill got her to um, add on and embellish a little bit, but Ellen was the epitome of preparedness. Um, Ann Holm, who's here, Ann <laughs> was our ENFP. Ann remembers the interview day well. You don't mind me telling no, you the tales out of school. <laughs> we, we, yeah, everything's free with what we've done together. So Ann's in her office. She was out of her chair at least four times in the first minute and a half of the interview. Once for the dogs, once she was eating toast, she didn't have enough to eat. Um, the blind light wasn't correct, so she got up to do that, and then she'd forgotten something, so she went to get that, and I think the doorbell rang, and you know, it just went on and on and on. Um, so Ellen's got her tight notes, and when she got the review, you know, she printed off the stuff to review. She dropped it in the bathtub. <laughs> so, so what we had, what we got with the ants, you know, handwritten scribbles of what we, what she agreed with and what she didn't was water laden. And you, you, um, <laughs> sorry, she scanned it upside down. <laughs> so, you know, goes over to Australia wet and upside down. So just that contrast between, you know, still shot and action was wonderful. Um, some of the best moments during the interviews, there, there was this moment, Jill's the ESFJ and the ENFP, right? And Jill's asking, what do you do when there's a specific new item that you need for your wardrobe? How do you decide this? And Anne said, well, that's easy. You know, I'm, I'm tall. Um, the stores don't always have what I want. So generally, I'll go online. Nordstrom's great. Everything's free return. And I'll order things in two or three sizes and anything that looks interesting and get it all shipped to the house. And Jill actually backed up from the camera and she said, what? <laughs> and Anne said, well, what do you do? And Jill said, well, I might start with 10 and then I'm reading everything and on the phone to the store checking on what the sizing actually is and the measurements across the, you know, like the arm measurement and how big the print is and what the actual, um, you know, if this is my size and this, what it might be because my goal is to go from 10 to one coming into my house, or perhaps zero if it's just not the right thing. And Anne goes, no, I love the idea of possibilities marching through my doorway. And Jill just went, what? <laughs> right. So you know, just these differences, you know, think if you're shopping together. There were, there were amazing differences just in who piled stuff into the cart to try everything on in the dressing room, and who's afraid almost to bring anything in? Like, it's the last resort to try something on. You, know, you, you don't even want to do it till you get there. Um, so, so it was just a, um, a magnificent interview process. INFP and ESTJ also, just a few interview contra. Oh, I know what I forgot on this one. So we, one of the questions we asked was, um, what's most important to you in how you dress? And the STs uh, all had some measure of appropriateness in what, um, what they had. So Sue Blair talked about, um, and this goes for the ISTJ or ESTJ. I'll, I'll, I'll talk, well, we'll wait till we get to your picture. Um, my sister-in-law, Ellen, said that if she, um, let's do the other ones first. Makes more sense. Okay. So Meredith and Sue Blair. And uh, Sue Blair said that if she got to an event and wasn't appropriately dressed, she would either turn around and go home and get dressed, ask the hostess for different clothing to wear, or apologize to everyone in the room for not wearing the right thing. Is that capturing yeah, your much. feeling about it? My ISTJ sister-in-law said she would die if she was inappropriate. <laughs> Does it get any more dramatic than I would die? She actually, now, now think about the value an ISTJ has on being on time. Do we have any ISTJs in the room? Do, do, what, what does it feel like when you're not on time? It's shocking. Okay, so Ellen said they were getting ready to go to church, and they were serving communion. Okay, so it would be very visible if they're not late. I mean, if they are late. And she realized she had not changed out of her black house slipper shoes into her church shoes. And she made my brother, the ENFP, turn around and go back home. And he's going, but we're going to be late. I don't care. I'm going to die if we walk into church. I'm going to be on. So that, that visceral thing, I asked, we asked Anne, 
what do you do when you find out you're dressed inappropriately? And Anne said, it's a learning experience. I won't wear it again. <laughs> you know, just this, when, you know, we're playing with people's values when we're talking about clothing. And it is this essence of who we are. Um, so you got Sue's story. Meredith said, you know, if I don't have the right thing on, or if you spill soup on something, I mean, it's accident of the day. There's nothing you can do about it. If people are going to judge you for that, you know, I don't have time for those kinds of people. So um, that same thing. And what would you do if you spilled soup? Well, yes, I was really conscious that I had I got yogurt. So I wanted to keep it covered to all afternoon. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Type will out. Type will out. So, you know, if, if I were coaching an ISTJ, it might be make sure you've got an extra jacket in just to make sure you're not caught in that situation. Whereas, and uh, make sure you actually record those learning experiences somewhere so it doesn't happen again. You know, uh, not that Anne's ever inappropriate. Okay. So, any questions just about the interviews or um, anyone want to tell a story? Yeah. Did, did you only interview people who you know had good sense of style? Was that one of the yes. criteria? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we w we went looking for sort of the mature. <laughs> <laughs> because we had ourselves. And that's when we played with what information was important. So, so don't feel left out. <laughs> we did ask you to look at it. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm just wondering about, I mean, you said you interviewed more mature people because I was thinking about um, stages of life, you know, how I now behave towards my clothes. It's so different from when I had four small children um, running around, puking all over me, doing whatever. I mean, I had to have a very different attitude towards what I was wearing, why I was wearing it, the whole utility thing came and it was totally not me. Um, so she's that? saying, you know, are there stages of life things? Yes, because we are dressing for our roles. So definitely, I would still, I would still say that there are certain personality types, because like Jill pointed out that even if she's out painting in old clothes, mm -hmm. her shorts and shirt were matched. Yeah, well, my sister does the same. yeah so That's they might be old, but you will still match, so whereas I will not notice what I have on. And I... It, you know, it's just drag. Somebody's up at 5 a.m. again, and I pull on what's ever closest. And, and uh, or I, don't, I don't know if that's true for you, but Jill would still be matched at 5 in the morning with a screaming child. That's just um, with some animal print somewhere. <laughs> I was going to say, um, I'm, I'm in a fee preference, um, arts based and therapist, um, mostly working with children, often very, very dysregulated children who will throw glitter angrily at me. Uh, and then I had to run straight into a social services meeting and try and be appropriate. And there was a hilarious moment one day where I went, went to speak to a parent of a child and had to talk about something incredibly serious. And she, I think she's nice too, and she sort of looked at me and she said, I'm totally, totally taking more everything you're saying and I really, I really hear you. And, and I also wanted to point out, oh, you're aware you have an entire head of glitter. <laughs> <laughs> that um, many of the types talked about, we asked specifically of the types that are least aware of fashion, like what is the catalyst for you becoming interested? And you'll see it on the charts. We're, we're going to do like a gallery walk. I, I have a little bit more to tell about our process and what we learned in the digital age about doing this, but then I want to give you time to look at what we discovered about the strengths and challenges of each type so that you get this feel for what we really heard. I have a question for you. Did you, did you find any connection to um, when, for example, for intuitive types, when sensing um, clicked into their type development? Did that make a difference in their awareness of when all of a sudden realizing maybe style was something they needed to pay attention to? Or any other kind of pattern like that where through type development where there was an age where certain types that Maybe I should take a look at what I wear and how I appear. Often it was more an external event. Um, for example, the ENTP, um, in, in this whole research project, only one person of the, the, at least 100 women, more than 100 women have seen the reports and commented on them. And only one said, this just isn't a valuable ex, ex, uh, application of type. It happened to be an ENTP. I'll tell you she's one of the worst dressed executives I've ever seen. So she's still totally unaware. The, the ENTP that we interviewed said she was only 24 uh, and gave a presentation at a conference. And a gentleman that she valued came up to her and said, that was an excellent presentation. And I hope you will take this in the right way. You need to change how you're dressed because you're undermining your message. 
And she took that. I mean, ENTPs, would you take that to heart? I mean, I guess I'll have to be fine. Yeah, and did you do something about it? Definitely. Yeah. So she went and learned what worked for her. And actually, she was. there were moments where I was backing up from the, the interview because, like, if she's, she talked about um, it, it is a costume and a statement for her what she wears in corporate events. So, you know, she takes a look at the... Uh, event figures out what will have the most impact if she's wearing it and she goes to the extreme of like a week in advance she takes the picture to her hairstylist and says start thinking about what hairstyle will go with this outfit so that I match from top to toe so there's this scheming element of and then not all would go to this way but she's I mean she's a high level consultant and so this is part of her marketing is wearing the right outfit and I don't know if you've ever gone to that sort of extreme um, um, I mean, I also work with a lot of consultants, so I dress accordingly, which means I have uniforms. I can sit them for uniforms. Those shoes go with that suit that goes with either that blouse or that blouse, and I would never deviate from the uniform. Okay. So that very keen awareness again it's of what's whole wardrobe, working. that's just for that particular... A whole wardrobe that's just for the consulting, and it's all matched and paired and yeah. um, put together probably with some sort of principle that's letting you um, know it what's is. right. Yeah. Yeah, okay? So type out. Type will out. Um, so Jill and Imogen um, didn't stop. We, we, thinking about the digital age, they wanted to make sure that um, they had the right materials to deliver the information. So they got together and did, um, I don't know, 65 different videos a few week, weeks ago. And I wanted to show you the one because there has been work on type and style, and it's often been a dichotomy approach. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work. And so I just want to show you their little bit on extroverts, introverts, and color. Go to the large. Hi, I'm Jill Chibbett, and I'm Imogen Lample, and together with Jane Kesey, we are 16 Style Times. Today we're going to talk to you about introversion, extroversion, and how much colour you wear. Can you pick an introvert or an extrovert when you walk into a room? What do you think, Jill? Well, this is an assumption and a starting hypothesis that a lot of people who've looked at this relationship, this correlation between style and colour and personality have assumed, uh, and not unreasonably, that if you walk into a room and no one was speaking, that you would be able to tell the extroverts because of the amount of colours that they're wearing, the amount of contrast that uh, they would uh, have, they would be more visible, they would stand out, they would be the peacocks in the room. And we thought this might be true, true. So in our research for 16 style types, we played around with that assumption and we found out that it wasn't true. Now, I know from my own personal experience, I'm an introvert and I wear colour. Uh, and I wear quite a lot of it because what I've discovered is that when there is energy work to be done, so when I'm going out to a training environment or just having to interact with the world, mm -hmm. rather than using what I consider my energy to be incredibly precious yeah. on having those interactions or even being seen. So sometimes as an introvert you can feel like you're just not seen, you, you're the wallflower, you disappear. Yeah. By wearing brighter colours or more obvious colours, colours, contrast, particularly the reds and the pinks, which are advancing colours, yeah. um, that it does the work for me and I'm much more easily seen and then therefore I can use my energy on what really matters to me mm. rather than just getting some attention. Mm. Yes, and we have had extroverts in the study that we've done who say, I feel, I believe that the energy I'm bringing with me because of my personality type um, is enough. That if I were to add to that um, high contrasting colour combinations, brighter colours, um, in a whole piece, rather than just say a single red item, for example, it's going to overwhelm people. It's going to get in the way of communicating, particularly with a mixed audience, um, where I'm wanting to have some sort of connection with, with more than just one group of people. Um, now, this can apply to any of the eight extroverts, but we've specifically heard it from ENTJs, ENTPs, and ENFPs that have specifically said this, I'm a big enough personality in the yeah. room, add too much colour, colour contrast, bright colours, and I'm just going to knock people out. There's just going to be no room left for anybody else. And what's interesting is I found with my clients who are the ISTP, INTJs, ISTJs, 
Mm. They love to use colour to give themselves some yeah. energy. This is so interesting. So, yeah. uh, so it's one of those things that you can't just assume just because someone's wearing black that they're an introvert, mm. uh, or someone's wearing you know colour that they're an extrovert. This is something, and this is one of just the small pieces that we've discovered in the research we've been doing over the last few years. Yeah. Um, that is within the 16 style part. So check back in at 16stylehubs.com to learn more about what we've discovered and what we're bringing into the world that combines style and type.